And God was seen in the minutia of every movement that was going on in the tabernacle worship. In fact, I think it's Zechariah where the Bible says that the people of the priest, and it's got Joshua the high priest, and God puts a, a, a new clean garments and puts his sin away and everything. And, and God's messenger tells the prophet, he says, these are men to be wondered at. Think about that. Because they were shadows. And they would go over and over the same movements every time they did their, their, their sacrificial efforts, uh, services for the people of God. And so they were men to be wondered at. And the most secret place in the tabernacle worship was the Holy of Holies. But you got to the holy place first inside the first curtain. And when you'd go in there, you'd see the altar of incense, which spoke of prayer. You saw, as it were, uh, the, the golden candlestick, which had seven, seven. And we don't really get a full understanding of that till we get over into the New Testament. And that was speaking of how God was going to have seven churches. And they were going to be the churches of the book of Revelation, chapters 2 and 3. And I won't go into that because I really love doing that. I'm going to behave, okay? I'm going to stay on point. They had the showbread, which was the bread of the faces, which is saying, speaking of the, of, the, of the tribes of Israel. In fact, every one of the tribes was supposed to bring one of those loaves from their midst, okay? And they brought it each week. You remember David ate the showbread. Well, that was them being represented. So they're on one side, the church is on the other. You've got the, you've got the, uh, the altar of incense, and you've got these movements that the priests would go through inside there, tooling and, tra and, and changing and exchanging and all of the things that were going on. And when it says dwells, they could not physically dwell there, but in their mind they could. Listen, you want to know what the secret place is today? It's the Word of God. You can dwell there every day. The Bible says that the man who's blessed of the Lord is like a tree planted by the rivers of water. He brings forth his fruit in his season. Whatever he does prosper. What makes him different? The Bible says he meditates in God's word day and night. And therefore, he, he, his leaf will never wither. If you have your mind around God's word, you will be able to navigate anything. You'll be able to navigate any plague. You'll be able to navigate any, any pestilence. You'll be able to navigate any crisis. Even in death and separation, the Bible says, we do not sorrow as those who have no hope. But you see, we understand that we're all going to have a grand reunion again. We understand that Jesus is on the throne and He's got everything in His hands and under control. And He's, 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 he's okay with what's going on. <laughs> he's allowed it. And there's reasons why He allowed it. And that's, that's something we need to consider. Do you know there's a, a battle that's constantly going on to keep you away from that secret place? Yeah. And you know what's funny? Uh, and maybe not haha -ha funny, but, you know, kind of weird kind of funny, is that he's been very successful. Has it? Across the nation, people are r relatively biblically illiterate. They don't know their Bibles because they haven't needed to know their Bibles. The Bible teaches us that there's a battle that goes on in the soul of those who do not know their Bibles. And so you're, you, you have to understand in Psalm 91, it's a conditional psalm. There are people on the radio, they love to tell you, just like a prosperity preacher, that this is for you. You're a Christian and this is your psalm. It's not your psalm if you're not dwelling in the secret place. It's not yours. If you're not dwelling there, you're outside of the secret place and you're dancing, chasing butterflies and there's a wolf out there and he loves to get the lamb. And you know, a lot of people don't even like to go to church anymore. And I think that's fine for them because they're just thinking, well, I'm smarter than God. God didn't know what we needed. I mean, yeah, you, you know, I need to meet that person who's smarter than God. God said he will build his church. The gates of hell won't prevail against him. But they've already said, no, I don't need church. You say, well, how much is church? Well, you say, you have too many church services. <laughs> you know what's funny about that? They met every day. Go back to the book of Acts. They met every day. If we meet two, three times a week, I mean, that's nothing. And there's a bunch of us who really struggle with this because, you know, sometimes it gets pretty thin. May I suggest to you that you remember that on Wednesday night we're here during this whole thing. We've been here. We've been here praying for our church and our people and the country. And don't you think it's time to pray? We hear the verse, right? If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face, then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sins and heal their land. Aren't you amazed that that's a truth that we all just sit back and say amen to? But in reality, 
In reality, yes, you can pray at home, but what about coming with the Bibles, with the saints of the Lord? What about being amount, around God's people? About uh, iron sharpening iron, reminding ourselves to come off of the ledge of despair, come off of the ledge of terror and, you know, just w worry and fear. How do you do that? You do that by getting the Word of God open. We're in the book of Philippians. Do you know what the book of Philippians is, is uh, uh, kind of titled by most people? The Epistle of Joy. Isn't that a good place to be in the midst of a pestilence? <laughs> We're in the Epistle of Joy. And what you find out about the Epistle of Joy is that there are impediments to joy. And you begin to go through chapter by chapter as we've been going, section by section. And we've learned some things about God and how His way is to get us through the times where our joy is being hammered overtly. Not just circumvented, but overtly. Uh, under assault. James says this, let him know that he which uh, converts a soul, I'm going to read this the other way because I've got them backwards on my notes. I'm going to read First Peter first. It says, dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims that you abstain from fleshly lusts which war against your soul. You know what he's saying? He's saying you can save your soul from a war. By what? By abstaining. So he gives us that. You're, you, you have a need to be in the shadow of the Almighty. You're not there if you're Involving yourself overtly in fleshly lust. James 1.21 says, Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. I love that statement. Superfluity of naughtiness. It means something that's superfluid. Do you know when you get into... The word really does say what it is. When you get into something that's naughty, it'll take you a lot further than you meant to go. <laughs> right? It will. The superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word, right? We talked about the secret place, the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. Interestingly enough, he's talking to his brethren. He says brethren in a verse or two before that. And he's saying, brethren, your souls still need saving. There's a song out there today. It's a contemporary song. It says, Lord, please keep saving me. It's not that I need to be saved in, in the sense of ultimate salvation. That happens once and done. Positionally secure. Positionally perfect before God. I, there's no condemnation. God sees me. We are made the righteousness of God in Him who died for us. That's what's true. However, there's this progressive thing. And boy, that can be rough. <laughs> if you've ever been perhaps on some uh, rapids. I know you guys look like the crowd I'm thinking have been on the rapids, right? Judy, have you been on the rapids? Have you ever been there? No. How many of you have ever ridden the rapids on one of those uh, big old boats? Yeah? Yeah? What are they called? The big old raft. Raft. You get on the rafts, go down the boat. We did that with young people and some people were just funny to watch. So we had one gal, she was in a fun yak. She didn't want to go with everybody. She said, I'll handle this. She's going down backwards and floating, you know, everything. So you see it, and that's the way many Christians look. They're going down backwards. They don't have any control of the paddle. They don't know how it is to be. The Bible says that you can save your souls by laying apart all filthiness and all superfluity of naughtiness and in receiving the engrafted word. James 5.20, and this is why I went backwards. That was 121. This is 5.20, and so we're actually going the right way here. Let him know. And this is talking about helping people get out of the mess of their own sin. He says, let him know that he which converts the sinner from the error of his ways shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. You say, isn't he talking about evangelism? No, he's talking about the brotherhood. This is the same place where it says, if any among you is sick, let him call for the elders. And he says he confess his sins and all that. He's saying, listen, you, you and I have a responsibility to be our brother's keeper. And as our brother's keeper, we begin to help people get their lives straightened around. And sometimes people get so uh, twisted up and bent up uh, that they need to call somebody to help them work it through. It would be like calling a number of people that are your friends, because it says elders, not one. And you bring them in and say, I'm going to lay everything out on the table. Maybe you guys can help me make sense of it. I don't know if I've sinned. I don't know if the heavens are brass because I've done something. Please help me because I'm really a mess right now. And people have to go quite far many times to, to ask people to come in on that mess, right? That, that's something people don't do very often. Our pride forbids it. But in the body of Christ, you can get so wrapped up that you have no song. That's why the Bible says, if any of you are sick, let him pray. And the word sick means weak. 
And it says, if any of you are, uh, you know, are, are, are joyful, let him sing psalms. I'm not sure that's the exact word there, but it's the idea. Because once you get freedom, you get, you get your song back. <laughs> so if you've lost your song, it may be the need to get down on your knees and say, Lord, search me and know me. So I tell you, the Holy of Holies is the place where the secret place is in the shadows. The Holy of Holies now is your Bible. You get to go in and see everything. Nobody had the, the clear picture of what's going on. Man, we get it in fine detail. We can build an ark down in Kentucky because we have a blueprint that's set forth deliberately. They built it to scale. It can take your breath away. By the way, if you're hankering for a road trip, they're opening June 8th without masks, may I say, <laughs> okay? So that's gonna happen down in, in, in Kentucky. So, the, so we see that the Bible tells us that, that this is a person, a conditional promise for a person who literally understands there's a secret place and that secret place is somewhere they have chosen to dwell. Not just visit once in a while. They're gonna settle down there. This is gonna be in their mind. They meditate on the law of the Lord day and night. Day and night, day and night. It doesn't mean you always have your Bible cracked. It means everything you do, everything you see, you run it through uh, the grid work of God's Word and you make a decision about what you think is going on around you. What do you think? right now is going on in our world. If you know your Bible, you know your eschatology, and you know there's a one world government and coming, and you know that there's an Antichrist coming, and you know, and you know, and you know, you can begin to sit down and grab that cup of coffee after all, because you've been trying to decaffeinate because you're so freaked out. You can grab that cup of coffee after all, and you say, I'm good, because I know this is right on, right on you know, schedule. Everything's doing exactly what? He said it was going to do. We've been preaching in this church for years that there had to be something that made America buckle at the knees. Somehow bring us down. And I want you to know that they are trying with every bit of exertion to bring America down right now. The entire world is arrayed against us. And there is only one human man right now who's saying, the churches will be open, see me. Because all of these governors out there are saying abortion clinics, not all of them, many of these government, the governors, the, the majority of them as I understand it, are saying churches uh, got to be closed and bars and uh, abortion clinics can be open. You go figure. That celebrates death and that denigrates life. Because we are the conduit of life in this society. This is the pillar and ground of the truth. This is where people find Jesus who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You can't shut out the life. Amen. The life cannot be squelched. The light cannot be overcome. The Bible says the light shone in the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome it, right? It can't overcome the light. Jesus is the light of the world. You and I now, by uh, you know, connection with Him, are the light of the world. Let your light so shine before men. You say, well, I don't want to be a hypocrite. I don't want to be putting on airs. Rain on that. Be a Christian. You don't have to even think about it. We talked about it recently, didn't we? Humility is not thinking less of yourself. Well, actually, this was a thing you missed if you didn't come on Wednesday. Uh, because he said, let this mind be in you, which was one of humility. Jesus took upon him the form of a servant. But we, we noted that in what we saw in Jesus in, in, in chapter 2 of Philippians was that humility is not thinking less of yourself. Humility is not thinking of yourself at all. Okay, It's really just doing and being. The be attitudes are what you become, not what you aspire to try to do. You don't try to be merciful. You become merciful because you see people in their, in their pitiful condition of lostness. So I say to you, these are passages you need to know. The secret place, where is it? The Bible says in Luke 17, and when he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he said, the kingdom of God cometh not with observation, neither shall they say, lo here or lo there. For behold, the kingdom of God is within you. The Bible says that we have the kingdom of God within us. And you understand that Jesus being in us, when it, wherever the king is, that's where the kingdom is. You know, if our president is over on a foreign soil, wherever he is, America is there. Amen. Because if somebody takes him out, they've created an act of war. And when somebody comes against the child of God, they're coming against the kingdom of God. This is why Jesus arrested Paul on the road to Damascus. And what did he say? 
He said, Saul, Saul, because his name hadn't been changed yet. Why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus whom you've persecuted, whom you're persecuting. Who was he persecuting? It's the whole previous verses were he was persecuting the church. He was compelling people to, to, to blaspheme the name of Christ. He was going after the church. Why are you persecuting me? Now I would say to anybody who would hear this on the air who's got a problem with Christians, why is it you hate Jesus so much? Now I'm not going to say everybody who's a Christian is a poster child for Jesus, but God says love your enemies to the Christian. So even that is something to get a mind around. You're not supposed to hate on anybody. And if you're hating on people, don't hate on them because people are pitiful. We're all pitiful down here. We need Jesus. And that's what the church does. It reminds us all to sit up straight. It reminds us all. You know, my wife likes to sit in her car, her, her back of her car is straight up. I get in there, I'm like sitting up straight. I'm like, she's always sitting up straight. I'm like, wow, I feel really guilty here. She's always sitting up straight. Uh, but, you know, she sits up straight. I have to uh, adjust that a little bit. But, you know, when we come together, how about this? When you pray with somebody else, aren't you more focused? You are, aren't you? It's easier to focus when you're praying together with somebody. When was the last time you prayed with somebody? One-on-one -on -one or two people sitting there praying together? That's huge. It's weird, right? Because in our day, they're saying get six feet apart. Anything the devil can do. Boy, if he gets an inch, you know, somebody says he'll be a ruler. Okay, <laughs> that's what's happening. And so I suggest to you that you have to remember the kingdom of God is within you. He says you know, he, he shall abide. This is what happens by default. If you dwell in the secret place of the Most High, you will abide under the shadow of the Almighty. You know what that means? That means He's right there. The Bible says God inhabits the praises of His people. Aren't you glad that's true? So when you get a little song going as you're going out the door, going to the res restaurant, going to the store, wherever you're going, you get a little song going, what do you have? You have the Lord's shadow right over top of you. I remember the Frank Peretti uh, novels, which kind of give a big picture of the behind the scenes. And sometimes they were on top of a car. Cars flying down the street road and all these angels are right on top of the car. It didn't bother them. They're just hanging out with whoever's in the car. We may think we're moving pretty fast. You know, 80 miles in one hour. That's pretty fast for us. Not so much for the angels, you know, they just can be there, you know, but they go with you because he gives his angels charge over us uh, the, the, lest we dash our foot against a stone and he, they're ministering spirits and so forth. The Bible says in verse 2, it says, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in him will I trust. Now this is the psalmist saying, he that dwells in the secret place. The Lord will be right overshadowing them. He says, and so I just want you to know by way of commendation, I'm commending this to you. I am commending to you to make the Lord your dwelling place. I am commending that to you. And he says, because I have found it to be true. I have said of the Lord, I will say it every day because once is not enough. I got to constantly go back and say, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge. Have you not felt like you needed to say you're, He is your refuge lately? Haven't you got to the end of yourself and thought, I need to kind of realize, I need to kind of dial it down a little bit in, in myself. And that's exactly what He would have us do. And He would have us say, I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge, my fortress, my God. In Him will I trust. That's the real determination there, isn't it? So He commends to you what He has done. That's called leadership. So we have a commendation in verse 1 and 2. When you look at this, you see him commending to us something that is to be trusted in. In him will I trust. And it's the Lord. Do you know trust is always reasonable if it's biblical? It always is founded upon reasonable evidence of why we should do this. In other words, saying I will trust in the Lord doesn't mean... That you can walk through fire <laughs> doesn't mean that you can go out into a harm's way, like walk across a busy highway without looking both ways before you do so. Do you know it's reasonable for him to say this whole passage is the pestilence psalm. He uses the word pestilence and plague throughout. So he's not talking about something we don't understand. But there's a point you have to dif differentiate between. Trust in God's fashion, get that, in God's fashion, is always reasonable. In fact, when you think of how that is achieved, 
I want to give you the secret of achieving biblical trust. Biblical trust always takes God into account first. First, not last, not I'm going to make my plans, I want to do this, I'm going to do that. Now, I hope, God, God, will you help me? No, you take God into account first. Now you say, well, I, I, I hope I do that. Listen, you cannot, you cannot do that if you don't know the Bible. Just saying, you get a little pass in the first days of your Christian life. It's like the colostrum of a mother's milk. That baby can't protect itself. So God ramps up the vitamins, the minerals, all of the uh, antibodies and so forth. Did you know that on the eighth day, a child has more vitamin K in their body than they'll have in their entire life? And that's the day God says to circumcise the males. On the eighth day. How did God know that? Uh, yeah. <laughs> right. It was his idea. And when he gives us stuff and we discover it millennia, not hundreds of years, not since millennia later, we look back and we say, God's pretty amazing. We know this now. Uh, medically speaking, scientifically speaking, God is reasonable. You say, but I was doing it by faith in those old days. Yes, they were. <laughs> they were. But I want you to know, looking hindsight, we see we can be able to trust God. You can trust Him. It's not just, I'm going to say it, I trust God, I trust God, I trust God. You know, it's like some horror show. You know, they, they got a little crucifix and they're walking through some graveyard and every, all those creepy things are out there. You know, and they're saying, oh, 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 I got this cross. You don't use God or the Bible as a talisman. It's not your lucky charm. It is your light and your lamp. And that's a totally different thing. You have to know the Word of God. And so I suggest to you that you have to take God into account first. You say, well, I am not sufficient for this world. Welcome to the party. None of us are. And the only people who really have any confidence in the evil day are people who are dwelling, meditating, and having the right relationship with God's Word, which is synonymous with having the right relationship with God Himself. The Bible says in Colossians that you're to let uh, the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Singing and making melody in your hearts, speaking to one another. It says let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. That's in Colossians. In Ephesians, which was written to a different group, but at the very same time sent by the same messenger, it was said this way, be filled with the Spirit, singing and making melody in your heart. How can you be filled with God? you got to be filled with the Word. It just doesn't happen any other way. There's no shortcut. There's no, there's no what we would call, you know, arguing with God. There's no compromise. You have to know the Bible. And you say, well, I've been reading it. I don't understand it. Keep reading. If I went over here and I tried to play this piano, I might get a couple of movements of chopsticks out, but that'd be it. I mean, and, it, and even that would be cringeworthy, I guarantee you, okay? But what I want you to know is if I really put my mind to it and I spent time with that thing, we could make it sing after a while. God's given you the capacity to understand. He's given you the Holy Spirit who is the companion so that you can understand. So you can. You just have to be willing to put in that little extra effort. God doesn't, doesn't just infuse you with information. He's given you a book and He says, Now what? Now what? Now spend some time with me. Spend some time with me. And eventually you're going to begin to love the showbread and the lampstand and the altar of incense and the ark and the law which is inside the ark and the rod of there and the budded and, and, the, and, the, and the tablets of stone and, and just the, 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 the various accoutrements, the, the show or the manna that was in there. there was, you, you begin, what? What? You know, we know this. We know this because we've heard it before, but we don't know, know it. And we have to know it. Beloved, if you do not spend time with that word, you're saying to the king of the universe, I really don't want to spend time with you. And I'm not talking about sitting down every time. You're going to get it in there and it's going to start talking to you. And you spend time with that. And then you get back to it. And sometimes you're saying, I know there's a verse in there. Go find it. Because if God's bringing it to mind, he wants you to nail it down. Well, the Bible tells us that the wise man, his eyes are in his head, but the fool walks in darkness. There's a lot of people who are being told on the radio, just like a, prop, like a prosperity preacher, if you just take this psalm and read it, you will be okay. I'm afraid to disappoint you, 
That is not true. This passage is for those who dwell in the secret place of the Most High. You have to have a relationship with Him. And you have to have some sort of a knowledge of how He acts. Otherwise, you can be what? You can be blown about by every wind and doctrine. Otherwise, you can have another Christ brought to you, another gospel brought to you. Do you know today we live in a day where the gospel has been kind of watered down, corrupted, and polluted, whether it's prosperity uh, side or whether it's legal side. You know, there's all kinds of, you know, ooey-gooey, nostalgic kind of Jesuses. It's, you know, it's get your Bible and get, get you a little coin, put it in your hand. It's got Jesus on it. It's got a little face of Jesus. You put that in your pocket, you're going to be okay. I'm sorry. If you sent $100 to a ministry and you got a little hanky and they said, we prayed over it, you might want to send it back. It's probably got Corona on it. I'm just saying. You can't trust the, the delivery men. This is the world we're living in. So I, I suggest to you that there's a point where you, when you know. So I said where you know it's what's reasonable to trust in. You can't just say I trust in God because somebody else did and it looked good on them. No, it's got to look good on you. And, you, and you've got to take God into account first. Your eyes then will be in your head. When your eyes are in your head, you're going to be times when you will hide. That's where I'm going. <laughs> there will be times when you hide. You remember when Jonathan, Saul was after David and Jonathan said to David, he said, listen, I'll tell you what you need to do. I need you to abide in secret place for a little while and hide. <laughs> you know, there's a time to hide. And can I say to those who are most vulnerable, you need to be careful. You need to be careful when you go out into public only because this one is a little nastier. You'd be in trouble with the flu. I read that in this, this write-up by John Hopkins. They said this is a lot like the flu. It will affect the same people in a hostile way. So even that was a revelatory for me. I'm trying to do my due diligence for you because maybe you don't know where to look or how to utilize the, the, the resources we have today. And I'm telling you, this can hurt a person just like the flu could. If your grandchild came to you with the flu and you knew that you were... You had some stuff that you didn't need to cut. It's a you know delicate ecosystem. <laughs> it's you. You've got heart things. You've got diabetic things. You've got some things. It's a delicate ecosystem. So you would be wise to hide yourself and say, Honey, I don't think you ought to bring the kids over right now. That is wise. That's eyes in your head. And you are taking God into account. It's not foolish to be careful in the midst of God's creation when there's something going on. But right now, we're up against something that's a little bit insidious. You might not know enough about it, so be careful if you're in that demographic of the two-thirds of the people uh, who are found to be most vulnerable in our chart that we gave you this morning on your bulletin. There's two-thirds of our population who need to be careful, okay? And uh, if you've got something and you're not in that demographic and you're just feeling a little puny, stay home. Don't go to church. If you're feeling puny, just because you're doing fine doesn't mean you want to take that and share your love with everybody else, okay? None of us want your flu. Uh, whenever you see a green uh, pearly nose on a little child, don't you just kind of get a little nervous? I do. I also get a little bit of a gag in the back of my throat. That's kind of gross. So all I'm saying is you got to realize there are germs and there is sickness and there is difficulty and you have to be mindful of it. David uh, hid out from Saul in the, in the hills of En Gedi. He hid out. Okay, there's a time to hide. Uh, Paul was let down out of a out of a city in a basket. What was he doing? Wasn't he? Didn't he have faith? Didn't he trust in God? Yeah, he did. But he used his brain, and he was wise about it. Okay. Now you understand this, but the devil wants to make everything a mosaic that is so confusing that you can't un wind it, unwrap it. My job today is to turn some lights on. And I want you to know that the first thing about being a person who is trusting in God is in verse 2 is that you need to take God into account before you make any other decisions. You say, well, I don't know God well enough to know how to navigate that. That is your sign from God that you need to delve into His Word. You need to listen more Read more, study more, ask questions of people you trust to give a balanced answer because if you Google your question, you're going to get 50,000 crazy answers and the one right one will be on the fourth page in. I'm not kidding you. I 
check out Google on certain issues and I have to go two or three in because I know what I'm looking for. Many times I'm looking for it so I can see where the verse is connected to this thing because I already know because I've been in this book for years. But there are people who get in there, man, it's like, oh, there's a thread. Oh, that's interesting. And what about the Nephilim? And what about, you know, all of the crazy stuff with the angels? And what about dang demons, man? What about Revelation? Hey, listen, Revelation's great. Don't get me wrong. Nobody's more excited about that than me. But I'm telling you what, I need to know how to walk today. I need to know how to walk today. I, know, I need to know how to navigate today. And the revelation's not doing me any good. Now, I'll tell you what, when the rapture comes, that's going to be your field manual, okay? If you're left here after the rapture, that'll be your field manual, and it'll tell you how you need to walk. And there's a lot of things that are very uh, situation-specific for that day. Verse 3 says, Surely He will deliver you. Did you see that? If you're just basically trusting in the Lord and careful, as He would have you be, naturally so, He will deliver you. But if you go charging into a COVID ward, just saying, I don't believe it's real, you're probably going to get COVID, okay? And you may not be sick, sick because you're younger. Listen, pastors are called to the bedside of people who are dying, or at least they used to be. Now it's not that way so much anymore. People don't call their pastor when they're getting ready to go. Uh, many priests are for sure because they've got to get their last rites in and they have a little bit of a, uh, a, you know, kind of a thing there and I won't go off on that. But the, the whole idea is, is that people don't do that. But pastors go on, when they, get, when they know somebody's in there, they'll go right in. And I've been in places where I've gone in to see somebody and I've been told to wear a mask. Guess what I did? I wore a mask. I wasn't going to go in there and not wear a mask. These people are supposed to know I'm going to wear a mask. Now, that's a little different than what we got going on right now. Because they're telling you everybody to wear a mask all the time. And there's problems with that. Don't be fooled. There are problems with that. I'm not telling you not to wear one. But you need to go study that. Because there are people who will tell you one side of this. And there are people who will tell you the other side of this. And most people are coming down on the other side of this right now. There are problems. This bacteria, this, uh, this virus, it's smaller than dust. It's smaller than the smallest particles that many of these mask people are wearing can even handle or deal with. Like a fabric mask, that's the worst because everything can go through that. That's maybe good in a sandstorm because the pieces are big, you know, like you see in uh, some in Saudi, uh, some Arabian people, they put it over their face, but that's about it. It's not going to keep a little virus out. So just say it. Don't just think mask, that's one answer to everything. No, I'll tell you what the answer to everything is. God is the answer to everything. <laughs> Jesus is the awesome. He's the answer to everything. So go with him and make sure you realize that you have to have some suspicions about certain messengers. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler. There's a lot of those today. The devil's out there. Uh, he's called the bird who comes and snatches up the seed. Remember that? Fowler. He's trying to get you. He's trying to get you through humans now because he's got a whole lot of humans in high places doing stuff. Uh, so he'll, he'll deliver you from the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. Now the word for noisome is a very interesting word. It actually has the idea, if I can pull this up for you, it has the idea of coveting or rushing upon. It doesn't have the idea of noise. I kind of thought, you know, on a surface level it means noise. But it means to, to, to have calamity involved with it. It has the idea of naughtiness. It has the idea of that which is a perverse thing, something very wicked. So it's a very wicked pestilence. Do you think we might have that today? 0 0.002 people in the working force today have been told not to go to work. The 70 and above probably weren't going anyway. But they shut the entire economy down for 0.002%. And that is a noisome. That is a wicked, wicked thing to do. And even now they're trying to keep it such. One of the things they were saying about the air problem, saying how long does this stuff stay in, the air, stay in the air, is they said if it was like what we were postulating early on, it would have gotten into any uh, system of uh, HVAC, heat ventilation system, it would, have, it would have gone everywhere. And everybody would have been wiped out. It'd be like putting gas, like you've seen in some movie somewhere, where they gassed everybody, and everybody's put to sleep or killed. Uh, you know, but that, that's what they'd say this would be like, but it's not. So all they're doing is giving you anecdotal ideas. They take one case and postulate or extrapolate from it. Be careful. Be careful what you listen to. You say, well, I don't know. Now you got me all nervous. Listen, that's your sign. Get in the Word of God. Do it God's way. Start with God and go from there. 
The Bible says He will cover you with His feathers. He's going to be right there. Aren't you glad? He's going to be. The Bible says, as the eagle, so the Lord. It's in, it's in Deuteronomy 32. You might put that in your margin. De Deuteronomy 32, 11 and following. As the eagle stirreth up her nest, fluttereth over her young, spreadeth abroad her wings, taketh them up and beareth them on their wings, so the Lord alone did lead them who were uh, in e Egypt. It's talking about Egypt coming out. This is Deuteronomy. He's reflecting. Interesting, he said, uh, and there was no strange God with him. There was no strange God with Israel in verse 12 of Deuteronomy 32. There was no strange God. The problem with America today is America, variety of Christendom, is there's a lot of other gods. Did you know there's a God of fear? You've heard of God of war, right? <laughs> there's gods of fear. The whole thing about uh, certain religions is they are founded upon fear. If you don't do this, you will be damned. And they will press that right into your face and say this is the way it is with no biblical foundation whatsoever. None. It's all about tradition in some sectors. And some people who have a very little understanding of the scriptures will bring to you other passages that are a little bit more complicated because they don't understand them. They take their best guess and they begin to not only personalize it, which is fine because you have to take your best guess at first, but when you begin to personalize it to the point where you begin to press it on other people, now you're, with a, you're like a child with a loaded gun. You've got the Bible, and you're shooting people, and you're wounding people. If you're not sure, just don't talk about that passage, okay? Because there are ones that maybe need a little bit more backstory. The entire book of Revelation is kind of like that. But this verse in chapter 32 of the book of Deuteronomy, it says he led them out like an like a, like a eagle, so the Lord. And notice it says he, he stirs up his nest. Do you know what God's done to your life today? He's stirred up your nest. Your nest is kind of freaking you out. It's like, am I okay here? Am I okay there? I saw this good thing. It was a picture of a man. He says, I'm okay. I've, he's in the driver's seat like they're trying to make a big break and get away. And he says, I'm okay. I, I, don't, I don't have coronavirus. I have no symptoms. He's ready to put it in gear and go. And this girl's in the back. But that's one of the symptoms not to have any symptoms. And he looks back at her like, what? You know, because they've got you coming and they got you going. And I'll tell you what. If that's the way they're going to play it, then I'm not going to be scared. Honestly. If they're going to play it that way, you've got to walk. you got to ask yourself, am I going to be scared? I'm not going to be scared. I might still be careful, but I'm not going to be scared. Listen, they're playing us in a huge way. There is not a million and a half people in the state of Ohio who are, have got COVID. This woman who's up there in the state house at the side of our governor is telling him stuff that she even has recent, uh, subsequently come back and said, well, I didn't really, uh, I, you know, I just thought maybe that was kind of a good number to throw out there. Just to get, and she was just spitballing for crying out loud. <laughs> you can't be doing that. You can't be doing that. You're playing with lives and you shut down the state of Ohio and it's on you if you are doing that at those high levels. It's like uh, the Bible says, be not many teachers, they're going to receive the greater judgment, rudder of a ship and so forth. It says that they sucked honey out of the rock and oil out of the flinty rock when they went out in the Exodus. Butter of kine, milk of sheep, fat of lambs. It says it was a great deliverance because that's what God does. But listen, it goes on to say this. But Jeshurun waxed fat. Okay. This is 40 years later. Deuteronomy. This is the second giving of the law. This is Moses toward the end of Deuteronomy coming out and saying, Hey guys, I'm about ready to leave and I just want to remind you, these 40 years, what I've observed is you all have waxed fat, you've, la you've waxed sinful, you've waxed lazy and, and lethargic and un un disconnected and dismissive of all things right and wrong. He says, but Jeshurun waxed fat. She kicked. And he says, thou. And he's talking to the people in, his, in Israel. After the 40-year wandering, because this is about the time, the, uh, the regime is going to change, or the, the leadership is going to change. And it says, thou art waxen fat. Thou art grown thick. Thou art covered with fatness. Then Jeshurun forsook God, which made him what he was. And he lightly... Israel lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. Does that sound like America a little bit? I think maybe it does. And it's the church that we're talking to, not America. Because the church used to be almost you know, synonymous with you know, America because there was more Christians than not. Many God-fearers mostly. 
Not many real, real bad boys for a while, and then eventually, you know, it began to, the tide began to turn, and eventually it's like the Christians. You know, there was more pastors in the original Congress of this country uh, than there were uh, secular people. These were the pastors. They were, they were there, they were called, they were brought in, and they would, they would make uh, uh, their votes known and, and, and stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with everybody else, and many, weren't, many were lawyers, uh, John Adams and so forth, but many were pastors. You think about that. So it was synonymous at one time. It's not anymore. It's not anymore. Church got comfortable. Everything was in place. They left and left it to itself. You ever done that? You fix something and you left it to itself. I, I rebuilt an engine in a love truck years ago. Rebuilt that baby. I had a few nuts and bolts left over at the end. But it was running good. And so I left it go. And then we moved to another location in our ministry. And down there the engine blew apart. And it was all because I forgot a few things. I let it to itself, and I didn't know. I probably should have. Good mechanic would have, you know, and that wasn't my, my wheelhouse. I was doing the best I could. But a good mechanic would have known I got these, and he would have thought about it. In fact, I worked on something this past week. I got this one screw left. There. Where's that? Where's that? Where's that? And finally, oh, yeah, I remember where it is. I pulled things back, and I put it in. You can't leave things to themselves because it will come back and bite you. It's not going to go away just because you ignore it. And so our Christians left the place of public service. The Bible says in verse 4 that he shall cover them. Remember, he gave a commendation. Well, here he's telling us we have a covering. And, uh, and as the eagle, so the Lord. And uh, in verse 5 it says, Thou shalt not be afraid. Well, there's the, uh, <laughs> there's the real question, isn't it? Am I afraid? Because if I'm afraid then maybe that's my sign to dig into the Word of God. Just like we have seen on so many levels already. Uh, he says, you will not be afraid for the terror by night. I remember back when the 9-11 attacks took place. In fact, our church is a byproduct of that. Uh, it was a year later this church started, and it was because I realized at that time I could not stand down as a soldier of the cross. I needed to preach and teach God's Word. That's why we're here today. And so as a result of that, this church was born. But it was during that time that I, remind, or that I realized, because of media and people talking about it, that terrorism is not about a gun on every corner. Terrorism is about the possibility of a bomb on every corner. It's the possibility. And what they've done is they've literally terrorized America and the world with corona and COVID-19. They've terrorized us. We're in a terroristic society right now. And, we're, and the, you know who the terrorists are? They're not Al-Qaeda. These are our own leaders right now. We've got a president up there who in the beginning was being hammered because he's trying to make everybody calm down. It's going to be okay. We're going to give it two weeks. And that thing got spiraled out of control. It went another 30 days. And then everything started coming unglued. And he began to realize. And he's doing some leadership now. I'm taking hydroxychloroquine. Just so you know, I'm, he can't say it was a good idea against his scientist. He says, it's just me. And I'm over here saying, I get it. I get it. Because you can't say. They, they, they played me. He could not say that. So it's a tough place. But you, if you know the Word of God, and you start with God, you will not be afraid of the terror by night, nor by the arrow, nor of, uh, for the arrow that flieth by day. Do you realize that today when you go to the store... If you don't wear a mask, some people will be mad at you. Some people, if you go to the store and you wear a mask, some people will be mad at you. Right? The arrows are flying already. Some people say, why don't you wear a mask? You should wear a mask. And they're just quoting what they've heard. And I get it. And some people are saying, why are you wearing a mask? You know, I, you know and they're thinking it's silly. But neither is right. Neither is right. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own heart. This is the whole concept of scruples. If somebody's got a scruple about a mask, you know, let them have the scruple. Don't freak them out. Doesn't mean you have to wear a mask, but you can politely distance a little more from that person because they're worried. And that's okay. It's understandable for crying out loud. They are scared because it's Coronaville all day, every day. Right now, we're in Coronaville. Welcome to Coronaville. And you have to be mindful that if you're not going to be afraid and the arrows aren't going to hit you, it's only going to be because you put God first. It says you're not going to be afraid by the terror, about the terror or the arrow. Nowhere are you going to be afraid for the pestilence in verse 6. That's the second time he's mentioned pestilence. He mentioned it in verse 3 as well. 
He says, that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. You know, it was Charles Haddon Spurgeon who utilized this passage when he was dealing with the plagues in the times of the 1800s. Some terrible plague was in London, and he was a minister, and he didn't know what to do. And he was a young man, and he was like dealing with this plague. I mean, people were dying. We're talking bodies in, you know, the back of carts, rolling them out. This is not today. That's what they had. We're in a day where you wear a helmet to ride a bicycle. Just say it. I mean, I get it. If you're in, my wife and I were talking about it, man, if you're talking about mountain biking, I get it. You might flip over. This is crazy. Wear a helmet, right? There's a time. That's wisdom. But if you're riding down the thing, unless you're pretty old and you're crickety, I get that too. But little children need to learn to get a couple cuts and bruises, right? That's part of it. If you're not, gonna, if you're not willing to get bumped, don't, don't play the game, you know? It's just the way it is. But what I'm saying for you and for me, this is talking about a time when it was really bad. They had plagues. It says, A thousand shall fall at thy side, verse 7. Ten thousand at thy right hand, but it won't come nigh to you. Why? You remember me telling my sons about the old idea of being an essential crewman? Right? If you're an essential crewman for God, you're not going down. Do you know the Bible tells us over and again that there were certain times in history where God is going to uh, uh, protect uh, individuals. You, you remember, of course, in the book of Revelation where the Bible talks about those two witnesses who are going to preach for three and a half years, right? And the Bible talks about the fact that they're, until their ministry was finished, the Antichrist couldn't touch them. Remember Dorcas? In the book of Acts? She was making things for the widows. She died. And she still wasn't out because she was an essential crewman. Peter came over and said, I get it, man. All these widows will not have anybody to nurse them and help them and encourage them. So what happened? He raised her from the dead. She got another couple years. The Bible tells us that there's a time for these things. I'm going to have to hasten because I don't want to wear you out. The Bible tells us, I will see where I want to go for here, from here. We, we're going to see throughout here, we've seen the commendation, we've seen the covering, and He gives you courage, which is what I was just talking about. He also gives you comfort in saying it won't come nigh to you. He says, I've got you. And then He gives us confidence. And when we're talking about confidence, we're talking in verse 9. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge. Of course, that's the psalmist talking. Because you have made the Lord, which is my refuge. He says, because you've made him your refuge, even the most high, your habitation. He says, there shall no evil befall you. In verse 10. None. Neither shall the plague come nigh your dwelling. Now you're talking about understanding Psalm 91. Because Psalm 91 is not... You know, put it on a paper, put it in your pocket, and you're good. It's a, it's, a, it's a psalm of truth. Make the Lord your habitation. Dwell in the secret place of the Most High. Your job is to dr drill down and take this personally. And it says why? Because in verse 11, He's going to give His angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. Do you know what that means? That means that little coronavirus may be coming your way. It's right there, floating around, but the devil is in those details. And the angels of God just kind of moves that away. Do you know God knows every molecule? You know, in Him we live and move and have our being. So that's not as big as it seems. I mean, He, we live in Him. Nothing can touch somebody whose ministry is not finished. And so we understand that. You remember, of course, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. We know, King, you know, that you want us to bow down, but I just want you to know our God's able to deliver us. But even if He doesn't, so we're okay with that. It makes us to have courage. We're okay. Even if He doesn't, I'm okay. If I get corona next week and I die of it, can I just tell you right now? I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that because God has got something much better over there. Amen. This is going to be done time. Okay, not Coronaville anymore. It's going to be glory. It's going to be heaven. You say, well, I don't know. I, yeah, I you kind of believe. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Because that is the thing that sets us free. You will know the truth. The truth will set you free. Don't misunderstand. Be careful. Go through the basket if you've got to get out of the governor's way because it says the governor was coming after Paul. I'm saying you be careful where you should be careful, but don't be scared. Don't be terrorized. The Bible says in verse 13, Thou shalt tread upon the lion and the adder, and the dragon thou shalt trample under your feet. You know, the Bible says we're to put on the whole armor of God, that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers in Ephesians 6. You know the devil is in the details of what's going on in our day. The Bible says 
that there are people, well, I'm going to go to this, Luke 10, 19, it says, I give unto you power to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Psalm 91 echoes that. Nothing shall by any means harm you. You say, well, that was to the apostles. I know that. That's why I said it out loud. I know who that's to. But I also know that Ephesians 6 is to the church. And it says, we wrestle against principalities and powers and spiritual weakness. And it says, having done all to stand, stand therefore. Okay? We don't get a, you know, we can't go into a demonically infused situation like the apostles could. Man, that, 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 that was another day. We can if we're prayed up and good, you know, like this forth, this cometh forth not except by, by, but except through fasting and prayer. And so Jesus had to step in. And when you read that, by the way, may I say to you, that wasn't talking about the apostles weren't fasting and praying. They didn't know the kid till they brought him. It was the dad who needed to be fasting and praying for the son. Can I get a witness? Amen. The dad needed to be having been fasting and praying for that son. This demon won't come out except the dad's in there fasting and praying. And so that would have laid the groundwork for some deliverance. Verse 13, thou shalt tread upon even the devil himself. Verse 14, because you have set your love upon me. And this is God interjecting, by the way. God often does that. Uh, he, will, he will interrupt because he's so excited about how good this is going. He says, yeah. He says, because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him and set him on high. Because he has known my name, he shall call upon me and I will answer him. He will, and I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Now, I, I, you know, I could spend hours here, so I need to sh shut it down, but just know this. What did he say? He said very deliberately, God was so uh, caught into the, the throes of this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the psalmist is going, and he kind of commandeers the pen and says, I will be there for him. I will, he set his love on me, and I will protect him. Now, that's the person who gets this psalm. This psalm is not for the lost man. This psalm is not for the Christian who is not willing to put a little time in getting to know God better. This psalm is not for the Christian who knew about God, walked away, and is kind of living large out in the la-la land. They, he said they had no false gods with them when they came out. Well, maybe you got some false gods now and you need to start saying, I'm going to do some inventory. Lord, help me. Cleanse me. Search me, know me, help me to understand so I can be, you know, completely what I need to be for you. You see? This is a conditional psalm. And what we do is we take it personally because when you come down to the end of it, the Bible says, Amos speaking, chapter 3 and verse 7, Surely the Lord God will do nothing but that He revealeth His servants, secret unto His servants, the prophets. Do you know God has just told us what He's going to do with plagues? He just told us. And He just told us what we needed to do with regard to the plagues. We need to do inventory. As the eagle saw the Lord, He stirred up our nest. He said, listen, I'm going to kick you out of the edge of the nest. You're going to be on the rock. I'm going to kick you off the rock. And you're going to say, what? As you fall. And you're so freaked out. And I lived that nightmare when I learned how to swim. Or didn't learn how to swim. And, the, and then the eagle swooped down and he got his little one and put him back up on the rock. That's what God does. Do you know what he's doing to a church today across America, across the world? Is he's kicking us off of the ledge. He's saying, it's time to spread your wings. I got no more use for this. You guys got to stop being non-issue in this world. You got to step up, st speak up, and stay up because God wants people saved. He doesn't want anybody to go through the, uh, through the tribulation. He doesn't. He doesn't want anybody to have to go through that. It's going to be the worst thing that's ever happened. You think this is bad? Tribulation time is going to be terrible. 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 13. The Bible says this. To the end that He may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God. Are you unblameable in holiness today? Maybe not as much as you should be. Maybe God flipping over your apple cart so you'll get unblameable in holiness before God. Even our Father at the coming of the Lord Jesus with all the saints. 1 Peter 5.10 says, But the God of, great, of all grace, who hath called us unto His eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that you have suffered a while, make you perfect. Establish, strengthen, settle you. See how this works. And then finally, or actually two more, 
2 Thessalonians 3.3, 3, But the Lord is faithful who will establish you and keep you from evil. And then finally, James 5.8, Be ye also patience, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. And people said, Amen. He's coming. He's coming. He's showing His prophets. That's you and me right now. We're the ones who proclaim truth. We tell people what this book says. Most of the times, that's what prophets did. When the prophet Elijah said it's not going to rain, he said that because he read that. The Bible says, if my people turn away from me, I'm going to make the heavens brass and the ground iron. And so God, he said, please make the heavens brass and the ground iron. It's not going to rain. He knew because he knew the book. He had that kind of confidence. Where are you today? Are you being unsettled, terrorized, afraid. I get it. I get it. I am trying to speak not just for me today. Think about my burden. <laughs> you know, I want to make sure I'm on good ground when I talk to you. I don't want to tell you something that's not true. So that's why I've tried to be very balanced in what I've said to you today. Today, you need to realize that God is in the business of making you like Jesus, whom He foreknew. Those He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son. Do you know what God wants you to look like? He wants you to look like Jesus. Do you look like Jesus today? See, we're our own worst enemy and critic when it comes to looks, right? That's okay. But what was Jesus? You might think of him as mean. He, in the sense of, you know, charging out those money changers. Some people might not know Jesus. They might think of him in the Old Testament. The, you know, the, might think of him in Revelation. You know, he's going to come with a sword. He's going to wipe everybody out. It's going to be a terrible bloody battle in Armageddon. Oh, that's true. But if I'm his child, I know him as father. I know him as friend. I know him as bridegroom. I know him as having no condemnation. As saying to me, there is no spot in thee. <laughs> I like that. I need that. And what he wants you to do is he wants you to know that. Because when you know that you know that you know that you know that you know that, you'll be unflappable. And that's where God wants you and me to be. Would you bow with me for a moment? You're going to hear a lot of things this week. There's going to be people who are going to uh, struggle with their businesses opening. You're going to read stories of maybe some resistance in California. To, I think it's the next week they're going to all open in California, or 12,000, 1,200, something like that. A bunch of them are going to open churches against the edict of a governor. What I want you to do today is realize that's all out there as a sign for you to dig in. Dig into your Bible. Dig into the Bible and the Word of God. Get to know it better. Get to know it personally. Don't be afraid of it. Many times people don't read their Bible because they're afraid. They're afraid it's going to make them feel bad. It's going to sometimes, but it's also going to make you know to, how, to, how to feel better. <laughs> That's what he does. So just really dig in today. Say, Lord, I want to be fearless. I want to be wise. I want to be careful where care, carefulness is enjoined. But I want to also be a witness. Tell him that right now. Lord, I want to be your child. What would Jesus do if he was in my shoes? What would he do? If you're here today and you're not sure you're saved, I, I feel bad for you. Because reality is, is there's only two kinds of people in the world, and that's the saved and the lost. And if you have any questions about your salvation, you need to get that thing nailed down. The rapture could happen at any time. The only reason that I think it's not going to happen is because God is so long-suffering, and that's what the Bible teaches. He's long-suffering. That's why it doesn't happen. <laughs> but at the other hand, He's showing us a whole lot of stuff right now. So we need to be make sure, make our calling and election of God sure. If you're not sure you're saved today, I want to ask you to pray this prayer. Just drill the stake in the ground and say, I'm going to, I'm going to do it because I've had questions about this. Pray something like this. Dear God, I know... That I'm a sinner. Pray it in your mind. God reads your mind. He sees what you're thinking right now. God, I know that I'm a sinner. And that I deserve judgment. But I also know now that Jesus died to take the judgment that I deserve. So I right now ask you to forgive all of my sin. To come into my heart and give me eternal life. That Jesus paid for when he died on the cross. I receive it, Father, as a gift, not by works that I can do. I, I know that you don't come to me saying, behave, because you know I cannot perfectly behave. So save me for Jesus' sake. 
Lord Jesus, save me. I believe in you. And I trust you as my personal Savior right now, plus nothing and minus nothing. And I take you at your word that whoever will call shall be saved. And I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.